everyone for coming. My name is Kristen Evangelista. I'm the director of the University Galleries. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone here today. Um, so I'm really excited to have this um, very important and topical conversation about freedom of speech. Um, and I first just want to start by making some thank yous, and then I will introduce the um, panelists. And then um, each of the panelists is going to talk um, for a couple minutes. Um, and then we'll have some discussion and there'll be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Um, so um, feel free to um, start brainstorming any questions that you might have, don't be shy. Um, so um, I first wanna thank um, the gallery staff um, for helping put together this event and the related exhibition, Speak Your Piece. I'd like to thank our gallery manager, Emily Johnson, and our collections manager and curator of visual resources, Casey Mathern. I'd also like to thank our work study students um, who, and our intern who aren't here today, but are a big part of what we do. Um, our graduate assistant, Angel Fosuhene, um, and our um, intern, Zoe, and I'm blanking, I'm like smaller, and um, Jackie is our work study student. So um, <clears throat> it's been a pleasure for us to have this exhibition, Speak Your Piece, which I encourage you to, when you have the chance on social media, to look up for freedom. So our exhibition is part of a national movement. There are over 200 organizations across the country presenting exhibitions um, at this moment in the lead up to the midterm election. Um, and this is part of a movement to recognize that art is a powerful tool um, for raising our awareness of um, 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 issues and, and getting people more engaged in the political process and thinking about what democracy is, what democracy means, and how we can all be a part of that. Um, so um, I also, if you are not registered to vote, I encourage you to register to vote. There's still time. Um, and we have voter registration forms outside the gallery. Um, but check out um, Four Freedoms on Instagram or um, Facebook. Um, you'll be amazed at all um, um, the artistic movement um, that's going on across the country. Um, and so we're excited to have you here to engage in that too. Um, so um, I'm grateful for the panelists coming out early this morning, <laughs> traveling. I'm sure, I know at least two of you traveled great distances and I'm, I'm sure Professor Victor and Professor Lauby probably Took a while to get here too, so it's early start for a day. I'm going to introduce our um, panelists in alphabetical order. So we have a wonderful interdisciplinary panel here, so I think that's going to give us um, a very rich perspective. And I know that our audience um, and um, our students from all different disciplines, um, not just art. So I think. Um, it's, we're going to have some good questions and discussion. Um, so first I'd like to introduce um, Hugo Bastidas, um, who's a painter who was born in Ecuador, where he lived until 1960, when he and his family moved to the United States, and he grew up in Patterson, here in New Jersey. He currently resides in Brooklyn, and he works as an associate professor at New Jersey City University. He received his BFA from Rutgers University in Newark, and his MFA from Hunter College in New York. He is a recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship as well as a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant, among other awards. He has been, his work has been widely exhibited in the United States and in abroad at venues including the Colombian, Columbia Museum of Art in Ecuador, the Art Museum of the Americas in Washington, D.C., and Mass MoCA um, in Massachusetts. He's represented by Nora Jaime Gallery in New York, and his work is included in the collections of numerous museums, including El Museo del Barrio in New York, the Newark Public Library, the Montclair Art Museum, among others. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Fanny Lauby. Um, I guess I should have you uh, raise your hand. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, she is an assistant professor of political science at William Patterson University. She received her MA degree from the Université Sorbonne Nouvelle in 2014. Um, she received a PhD in political science from the City University of New York Graduate Center, as well as a PhD in American Studies from the University Sorbonne Nouvelle. Prior to joining the faculty at William Patterson, she taught at Baruch College and also at the Sorbonne Nouvelle. Her research focuses on the experiences and the political mobilization of immigrant youths in the United States. Okay, sitting 
to her left is the artist Raymond Mingst, who is a multi-talented artist, writer, and curator. He was born in Hackensack, New Jersey, and lives and works in Jersey City. He has shown and collaborated in various capacities with many galleries and institutions, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art, the Center for Book Art, the, the Newport Art Museum, and others. He is also the founding member of a literary journal called Ignite. He founded the Cabinet Gallery in the East Village of Manhattan, and he co-founded Curious Matter, which is a contemporary art gallery and project space in Jersey City, um, which I just want to point out, they're celebrating their 10th anniversary, and they are having a reception on October 6th. October 7th? 7th. Uh, 3 to 6, you're all welcome to come to Jersey City. Yeah. All right. It's a wonderful um, art space. Um, last but not least, to my left is Dr. Elizabeth Victor. She is the director of the Liberal Studies Pro program here at William Patterson and an assistant professor in the philosophy department. She received her PhD from the University of South Florida in 2012. Um, and during the final year of her doctoral work, she was a visiting researcher in the philosophy department at Georgetown University. Her research explores how moral theory can provide conceptual tools to guide our personal practical actions and public policies. She argues that a good moral theory should be useful in guiding actions in non-idealized situations and be able to address the social reality of particular people. In other words, our moral theories and public policies should be responsive to the fact that we live in a society in which some are systematically more vulnerable in the light of the way social institutions respond to differences in gender, race, class, or sexual orientation. She draws on contemporary moral theory, agency theory, and feminist philosophy to critically examine contemporary ethical issues through a non-idealized lens. Her research interests are broadly interdisciplinary, bridging conceptions of group agency, individual autonomy, and personal freedoms as they are taken up and played out in different facets of society. So as you can see, we have a very accomplished um, group of panelists here. Um, so I've asked them each um, to speak either briefly about um, their research as it relates to um, freedom of speech or for the artists about how they feel from their perspective as artists, um, um, how freedom of speech relates to their practice. Um, so we're just gonna go in um, alphabetical order. If that's okay, Hugo. <laughs> I'm speaking first. Hi, uh, am I too close? Is that, is that all right? Right. Uh, thanks, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's really a, a honor. I really appreciate being here to share my, my story. Um, so I, I, as an artist uh, and growing up in, in, um, in Patterson, uh, it, it, it sort of informed how I make art. And um, the, um, that impact, so it's another story, uh, made me realize that you you, one of my uh, concerns as, as an artist is, is to reflect uh, and to uh, reflect a moment. Um, and, and those uh, two things are, are really important as I uh, view the world uh, because uh, memory fades, future is unknown. So I really basically keep to that. And uh, as I do this, I, uh, I address conditions with, with a certain amount of research and from a different vantage point, which was uh, part of the uh, Fulbright experience. I uh, was able to see a culture, even though I'm from there, um, in a way that I hadn't seen before, returning for a year. Uh, and that kind of uh, perspective brought me back here and I could see the same thing uh, here uh, in this uh, macro uh, that I saw in Ecuador at, in, in this micro. Um, what I did see was uh, uh, certain beliefs that we have here that uh, persist. So when I started doing this uh, Native American series, one of the uh, uh, pieces was to uh, negotiate what 
it meant, what it could have been. And um, th there's a, when I was growing up, there was a, 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 a phrase that uh, caught my attention, so, Indian giver, which uh, always fascinated me. So I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but I know that if you gave something and then you took it back, you were that. So um, uh, one of the paintings that's in the uh, gallery is uh, Chief Pontiac. Now, you have to understand, from our perspective, land ownership is normal. From other people's perspective, it's not. And uh, when uh, Pontiac uh, negotiated with the settlers in, in Illinois, he had no idea that that was the, the condition. So when he wanted to venture back into Illinois, he was trespassing, uh, which is, again, uh, it's two cultures clashing. Uh, so th this, this kind of idea that we continue to perpetuate doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Um, as what we're dealing with with uh, Iran. I know Iran, that's our, our enemy. And quite frankly, it's not. We're their enemy. Um, we forget that the United States invaded Iran and put up a proxy government. And when the Iranians went back to claim it, they held uh, embassy hostage. Uh, but yet we, uh, not we, those that are in power, they continue to perpetuate this idea that they're our enemy and they're not. They're really scared. They're scared of us doing that again. Uh, so how do we uh, negotiate that? And as an artist, I constantly am looking at it from different perspectives so that I can then uh, put it forward, share it, and in a, in a way that isn't overt, but is more subvert or clandestine. All right, that's my story for now. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, bring this up. Um, so um, I'm uh, coming to this from a slightly different perspective. I'm a political scientist. Uh, I'm also, I don't know if this is working well. I'm also a, um, I'm a French citizen born and raised. And so one of the things I try to emphasize when I teach intro to American government, some of you might have taken the class, we always teach a, cl teach a class on civil liberties. And I use France as a counter example to the United States because the US does have extensive freedom of speech compared to other countries. And I'm not just saying other, you know, compared to North Korea or something, but even compared to countries like France, the US has much more a much more extensive conception of freedom of speech. And, um, you know, we've seen this uh, fairly recently. Uh, so some of you might have heard uh, in 2015, there were a lot of uh, terrorist attacks in France. Um, the first one that occurred in January 2015, it was a newspaper that was attacked. Um, so uh, two guys showed up and just shot up the press room. And the reason they did it was because that newspaper had published cartoons that were considered to be offensive. And um, it's following the attack, there's this big uh, solidarity movement in France, solidarity with the newspaper. Uh, and there was also this counter movement where people were saying, well, what they had done was very offensive. So it sparked a really big debate over there about what exactly is acceptable in terms of uh, art, political art, uh, what can newspapers do. And um, so it really led me to investigate what's the difference between um, freedom of speech in the United States, freedom of speech in France. And um, you know, France is very restrictive in that sense. So the key difference for them, uh, and it's, I always have to look down because it's so, uh, so small, the distinction. So in the United States, you can basically uh, there's no prior restraint. So you can print whatever you want, um, but the government cannot step in to tell you you can't print that. They can step in afterwards and they can challenge you for libel, slander, they can charge you for obscenity, uh, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but uh, the French government has the power to step 
up and prevent a publication from publishing something if they feel that it is inappropriate, that it would create danger. And so that's a big distinction um, in terms of what government can and cannot do and how it can affect not only the work of journalists but also the work of artists if they feel like that would create danger for the rest of society, um, whether that's a real or imagined danger and regardless of whose interests are being served by that, uh, by that particular ban. Um, so that's what I wanted to bring up. Thank you. I think you're next, Draymond. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, I guess first off, I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, Kristen Evangelista for putting together um, a really exquisite exhibition. I'm really honored to be part of it. And I'd, I'd like to acknowledge everybody here at the university um, that I've had a chance to work with. They've, they've um, treat us, treated us all with such, um, such respect, and it's been a really beautiful uh, experience. Um, this panel is a curious thing for me because I feel distinctly unprepared and underqualified to speak on any of these issues. Um, I was trying to reconcile what, what my installation is and that project with some of, actually what I saw on uh, Instagram the other day. Part of the Four Freedoms Project uh, was these, um, these wonderful wall, uh, not wall, um, lawn. Lawn, lawn signs. And they all had these really powerful declarations on them. And I was so impressed, and it, it was about um, uh, things that people believed in and wanted to fight for. And um, my project is, um, it's about mourning and loss. And I, I don't feel like I have a powerful declaration. And I tried to figure out, well, um, what do I want to declare then? How can I get on board with this project? And what can I say? And there was the freedom from and the freedom to. And the first thing I hit on was the, the freedom to grieve. And um, uh, Let me read from my statement, if I may, because that'll get me back on track. Um, history is composed of interconnected stories as well as distinct modes of storytelling. The Department of Reparative History is an imagining of a cultural dialogue recalibrated to include missing narratives. Specifically, it is a meditation on what is missing as a result of the HIV AIDS pandemic. The legions of creative gay men who were taken by the disease in the 80s and 90s were all part of a complicated and exquisite network. Whether artists, writers, collectors, appreciators, the effect of those losses on our culture is beyond fathoming. At any gallery or museum, take note of the artists born after the 1940s. Who is represented? There is a yawning hole. Where are the gay men, the men who have always been indispensable arbiters in the cultural discourse? When confronted by catastrophic events, our society generally insists on a narrative arc that includes acknowledgment of the tragic event or circumstances, the comforting of the stricken and impaired, followed by a time of restoration and renewal. For many caught in immediate proximity to the crisis, the thought of closure and a new beginning simply isn't a possibility. The terrain is too scorched. Further complicating that storyline is the fact that the effects of the pandemic are still being experienced in ever-changing global configurations. The story of HIV AIDS isn't exclusive to the gay men who were the first dramatically impacted community. However, the stories of those at the forefront of the assault and the skewed cultural narrative that resulted from those losses are the interest and sadness at the core of the Department of Reparative History. The facts and evidence of the chronicle, uh, chronological and physical narratives surrounding HIV AIDS are documented. 
yet it is something that exists outside of our conscious awareness, pieced together through ephemeral reports, cultural detritus, and the clues that exist in the cultural at large that serve as the raw material for a contemplation of a narrative that might have been should the crisis never have happened. The Department of Reparative History is a plaint, an utterance of grief and sorrow It's a lamentation for a missing history. It is an attempt to hear a signal in the ether. Um, my project is about history because I've realized now that we're looking back at this crisis as history and um, I get emotional about it because it's my lived history. I'm living this. So it, it becomes new every time I talk about it and so that, that's what I'm doing with this project. I'm trying to um, connect to uh, those that I've lost, um, the mentors that I've lost. Uh, I was meeting so many in the 80s and 90s, um, men who were in the arts, and they would talk to me about the fact that everyone they knew, everyone they collaborated with died. And it was just, um, it just was a world of mourning. And um, so that's what I'm trying to do, is to uh, acknowledge that and to uh, speak to that. Thank you, Raymond. OK. And now for you, Dr. Victor. So I'd just like to, again, thank um, the gallery for putting on this really great exhibit and hosting this panel discussion today. So whenever we talk about the freedom of speech, I think it's really important that we situate where we're coming from in regard to the subject matter. So one of the things that's really great about this panel is that we have such a breadth of experience, both personal experience and professional experience, to give us different insights into what we call the freedom of speech. So I'm approaching the topic as a philosopher as an ethicist, but I'm also approaching this topic as a queer woman living in the United States. So when I think about the freedom of speech, the first thing that I have to recognize is that um, the freedom of speech and expression is one of the reasons I have the right to vote in this country. It's one of the reasons I have a right to have a bank account that's not under my husband's name. It's one of the reasons why uh, I can marry someone of the same sex if I choose and have that marriage recognized. So when we think about the freedom of speech, you know, it's one thing, I think, to think about it theoretically. And I do that a lot in my work, and I'm going to speak about that in a second. But I think we also have to think about the very practical effects of the freedom of speech and expression, the ability to protest, the ability to grieve publicly, the ability to put one's narrative out there. And we're seeing that today with the hashtag MeToo movement, with the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement. And so whenever we think about the freedom of speech, it's not just something that is a history. It is our lives. And it's a privilege that we have it in the way that we do in this country. In order for democracy to function, um, many philosophers, including John Stuart Mill, who I sort of take up in some of my research, argues that the freedom of speech and expression is necessary. We have to have something like a marketplace of ideas to engage with each other to challenge commonly accepted opinions, to exchange falsity for truth. Even if we know what the truth is, we still have to be able to debate it to ensure that we've got it right. So in my own personal research, a lot of what I'm looking at is different kinds of speech acts and how speech acts function in different parts of society. 
So a lot of my recent research is in the field of bioethics and science ethics. And so um, a piece that I wrote a couple of years ago focuses on whether scientists have a responsibility to how their work is interpreted. So whenever we talk about the freedom of speech, we also have to situate it in regards to who's doing the speaking, to whom are they speaking, and how are those speech acts then taken up and interpreted? When we look at artistic representations, um, you know, there could be what the artist intends, but then there can be this whole other life that art takes on, right? How people uh, fill out the work for themselves, which the artist may or may not intend. So whenever we look at pieces of science, when scientists publish their work, we can ask, how is that different than the work of artists? Is it different than the work of artists? How clearly the processes are very different. The scientific method is a different beast. But the way the speech act functions could have very similar effects. It can spur conversations. It can spur policy debates. So that's all I'm going to say about my own research right now, but I'm happy to get into specifics during our panel discussion or if you have specific questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you each for your comments. I feel like we've um, brought up some really interesting um, concepts and there's definitely already some overlap. Um, I wanted to start um, kind of following what um, um, Professor Victor was talking about, about the role of art, um, and ask the artists if they perceive that um, making art as being a forum that gives them more liberty um, to express themselves um, as opposed to other disciplines, um, or if they, f because it is a visual form of communication, generally, as opposed to written communication. Do you feel like it's in some way liberating, or do you feel like it's more like thinking about moments in our history, such as the culture wars? Is art more subject to scrutiny from non-art audiences, and therefore more a more restrictive form of expression? If you have a personal opinion on that. Uh, yes, um, I, I find um, it is liberating to uh, express my uh, feelings through art, but at the same time, I, I feel that it, it's uh, it's rather um, it's a fine line between uh, avoiding being illustrative and being more non. Illustration is pointing it out. Uh, but uh, fine art, it actually allows the, the conversation between the viewer and the, the work to happen. Um, so I'm going to show you some slides. Um, so this, this is a painting. It's titled, uh, Brave Men Are uh, in My Family. And uh, the painting is a, uh, it's a stag obviously, right? Uh, and I can't, I don't want to illustrate the idea that it's uh, male bravado is really not, uh, it's not hardened. Uh, it's actually, uh, there's so much more in, in, in humans and especially uh, the way we see men as, oh, no, they're, they're not going to break down. Uh, so the, the, the piece is, uh, the, the stag is actually porcelain and it's in the forest. You can see the puddle um, that the stag figure is sitting on. So I try not to do it overtly or explicitly. I try to do it so that you look at it and go, oh, that's a nice stag. The same. How do we perceive our accomplishments? And uh, it's, a, it's a fighter plane going over uh, uh, looks like a farmland, and it's a, actually a closer inspection, which is what I, I hope that you you do when you're looking at art, is to look at things more intently. Um, you can get away with saying what you want to say by uh, doing it in a uh, more, I guess, lyrical or poetic way. 
So the plane actually is a toy, and it's a dishcloth that is flying over. Yeah, we make up the story, and it comes off from our perspective. We, um, and then we cling on to it as though it's truth. Uh, and regardless of how, how much you believe it is, it's not true. And um, as I said before, I, I react to our condition. So when um, the first uh, powerful men started to um, be accused of, of uh, impropriety, uh, it, uh, I thought, of, wow, this is amazing, one after the other. And, and certainly I've, I've come across such men. So I, uh, I depicted it as a tree being uh, trimmed of all its uh, branches and titled it Preparing for Spring. Yeah, and it's not directly affecting uh, or addressing that condition, but it's me reflecting it in a poetic way. Very much like um, Delacroix's The Raft, which was reflections of, uh, of the French people being uh, screwed twice after the revolution, right? Napoleon the hopeful. And he turned out to be no better than the aristocrats they, they got rid of. Uh, and this is my reaction to, uh, this is my reaction to the last election. Uh, where I was extremely disappointed. Yet, uh, the little figurine, small girl in a dress, looking at this forest and it's overwhelming, it, uh, it's not going to daunt her. It's not going to daunt Anyone? Hopefully, you proceed. Uh, the title is "Despite." Yeah, I, I, I saw it daunting, but at the same time, uh, that wasn't going to stop me from um, protecting everything I believed in. And uh, th this is also part of the, the this general direction that I go into. And, and this one's called uh, de um, decodification. Just trying to figure out what it is that we're looking at, what it is that we're in, how did we get here? Uh, just a, a constant, uh, I think, obsession with me. You know, not that I think there's a wrong and a right, but that how do we arrive at these places? And if we can find out how, then we can prevent it. And this is uh, titled iCloud. E Y E cloud, uh, and um, it's uh, my resistance a, a, about having my information available or somewhere else where I can't control it. Uh, yeah, I, I know that uh, we all carry phones and we have iClouds and maybe we use that, um, but there's no guarantee that it actually is safe from anyone else. We just assume, which is really bad practice, I think. And uh, this is also uh, uh, the same thing. It's like what, how, reading it, decoding it. How do you uh, negotiate it without me being uh, explicit? Uh, this one, I'm, I, I won't tell you more. So um, this is a brown boy. It's a parallel series that, I'm, that I've been doing. And uh, I guess you know Gainsborough's painting Blue Boy, yeah, this is a Brown Boy, and uh, just the idea that if we had approach, and, and because I'm, I say we, uh, um, my heritage is uh, Spanish, right, from Barcelona and from uh, the north of Spain, but I also have uh, indigenous blood, I have Incan blood. So if we approach the situation differently, what would it have been the outcome? Would there be a share of, of knowledge, of institutions? Uh, so it's a question that I pose when I, when I work on these. And the, same with, uh, and the same with this one, Red Cloud. The same. Uh, what if there was a mutual understanding between the two instead of uh, annihilation, decimation, and conquest? Where would we be now? I'm sure that we would probably not be con concerning ourselves with 
being more friendly to the planet that we're on as the natives that were here were or and hopefully continue to be. But that's how I see uh, art being a, um, a way to speak and to navigate around such a uh, hard censorship that we find here. Um, and and I'm, I, I love France, I have to say, because they, they didn't give up their revolution like we did. Yeah, there they have planned strikes. I, I looked at a uh, uh, schedule, train schedule. I got it, uh, I think, in August. And I'm looking at it going, hmm, 3rd of September, no service. And September came and like, why isn't there service? It's a planned strike. And I said, wow, well, that's really strange. Why would they do that? Because people want to feel empowered. Uh, there, the government is afraid of the people. Here, we're afraid of the government. It's really odd. I think we needed a second revolution. Yeah, the second time they got it right. And anyway, but so I see it that way. How be, being an artist was really crucial to having a switch, to ha being able to, to navigate such a tight rope that you have to do when you're presenting artwork. Because being overt <clears throat> usually repels people. You're like, whoa, that's way too much. Uh, but when you discover it yourself, you tend to own it and walk away more satisfied. Thank you. Do you have any comments, Raymond? I don't. Well. Oh, could you please pull your microphone closer? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. sorry, we're having trouble with the sound. Thank you. So I was I was with you until you said not to be overt. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I. It de it depends, I guess, on on. Yeah, I'm, and this is where I start to struggle because um, what I'm trying to get at with my work, it, it, it's this conversation is what happens after. Um, for me in the studio, I'm trying to get at a truth. I'm trying to understand something. Um, it, it, it is a, uh, an inquiry. In fact, this specific uh, project, the Department of Repar uh, Reparative History, is um, I structured it as such because I'm, I'm trying to get at something and I don't really understand it yet, and, and uh, it is related to something else you said. I re even wrote it down, what it could have been. I love that turn of phrase. Uh, what could it have been? So this is what I'm grappling with. Um, and, and then, uh, when the work leaves the studio, um, I guess with regard to freedom of speech, it's not a problem until it's a problem. Um, it, it for shows, uh, I was talking to Arthur Brusso, uh, artist curator who's here today, um, and we were talking about some of the, um, the, the greatest hits of censorship in the art world, and um, one of them was the Maplethorpe show uh, in the 80s. Big, big deal, big uh, case. Um, that was a traveling show. It, it was quite comfortable in its first venue. Sat there, everybody was fine with it, and then, went to Cincinnati and all hell broke loose. Um, so th that, that's where this conversation, I, I, I'm just so interested to hear you guys on this because it's sort of like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grapple with this work to, to, um, to present a truth and it goes out in the world and then, oh, it's a problem. Well, what, what do I do now? I'm asking. <laughs> do, you have a, do you have a response? Any responses? To what do you do practically speaking? Um, yeah, sure, actually. Like, like tips on, on being censored. How do you deal? How do you deal with it? So censorship when it comes to the line between quote unquote obscenity and art, uh, that comes back to, what's the big test? The Miller test. Ah, look at that. 1973. Ah, I have a, I have a quote about that. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, so the Miller, the Miller test has 
three parts to determine whether something counts as quote unquote obscene. Uh, the first is whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find the work taken as a whole appealing to um, obscene interests, whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by applicable state law, and I'm going to come back to that state law thing in a second, and then whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So the work is considered obscene if and only if all three of those conditions are satisfied. So one of the things that I find really interesting is how location determines in large part whether we consider something obscene. Whose community are we presenting a work to? Right, so how many of you show of hands know about Maplethorpe? Okay. Oh. So basically none of the students yet. It's still early in the semester. Okay. Okay. <laughs> They'll get, that, they'll get that graphic warning so um, before the slides go up in the classes. So Maplethorpe, um, and you can add to this, I'm just doing like a super quick gloss, uh, was primarily black and white photographs of um, nude men in some very close up suggestive postures of male genitalia. I think that gets us all on the same page. So, if you are showing that to um, people in an exhibit in New York City, your reaction or acceptance is going to be radically different than if you go out to the Midwest in Cincinnati. <laughs> so um, I, I, in some ways, given that I've been to Ohio, don't find it surprising that Cincinnati <laughs> was like, um. We need to put something there. So, um, but this, this gets into how we interpret something's literary or artistic value. Until we have these conversations, right, about why something is valuable and whether offense is in itself valuable, um, you know, we can't really talk about how robust our freedom of expression is. So practically speaking, if somebody says that that's offensive, my, my initial response would be, well, why? What is it that you find offensive? And that gets the push against the fact that it has value. If you're offended, maybe you should interrogate your own offense. I, I could, could I follow? Uh, uh, the, the Maplethorpe uh, show uh, got its... Uh it's infamy from a uh, North Carolina senator, Graham, Jesse Graham, I think. Jesse Helms? Was it Jesse, Jesse Helms, Helms, sorry. I knew it was Jesse, Jesse Helms. And it was uh, really on, on uh, nude photographs of children that was in the show. Um, but that tells a lot about Jesse Helms because he found it uh, uh, offensive when in New York, uh, they're looking at it as a uh, as beauty or nude. It's a nude. He saw it as naked, which is quite different, right? Naked is when you're showering, and the shower curtain is pulled, and you're like, "Whoa, what are you doing?" Uh, nude is uh, when you your job is a model, and you you sit on the pedestal, and you take off your clothes, and you have your suit on, which is your skin. So Helms told a lot about himself by being offended by that. Anyway, just wanted to add. Um, I do wanted to say too, um, in terms of how you can respond and how you can react, um, this is a American political culture, it's a, it's a liberal political culture, not liberal as in left wing, but liberal as in focusing on individual liberties. Um, and so it's a culture where we constantly refer to this one document, the Constitution, and the rights that are being granted by the Bill of Rights. And so one thing you can do if someone tells you this is offensive, I don't want this, um, you know, and 
you can just respond by emphasizing your right to present this, right? You have freedom of speech under the Constitution, and uh, symbolic speech is heavily protected, right? So there's been amendments introduced in Congress, passed actually in Congress to ban flag burning because people find it unpatriotic and uh, offensive to the nation. And that was struck down in the Constitution because symbolic speech is uh, protected. Um, things that the vast majority of Americans would find uh, completely offensive, like cross burning, uh, so something that's part of the Klan lore, uh, that also, in certain circumstances, has been protected uh, by the courts. And so because it's considered to be a, an expression of a political view, and so um, I think that's one way to say, well, you, you know, you can understand concerns about uh, people not appreciating a particular exhibit or, uh, but as an artist, you do have that right, that same right that everybody else has uh, protected under the Constitution. And this is the political culture where that particular type of argument actually works, I would say. Something else I think about is... Oh, um, can you please be closer I'm to the mic? I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I also don't put the seatbelt on. It's technology <laughs> in general. Um, it, it also makes me think about that test because um, sometimes you want to be offensive and sometimes you don't want to be serious. So yeah. what do I do with that? <laughs> I'm, I'm here as a student today. <laughs> so, I mean, again, there's nothing in the, the Miller test from uh, the court case was 1973, Miller v. California, that says that you have to be serious, yeah. right? Lots of artistic expression isn't serious. Um, and there's nothing that says that you can't offend, right? It's a question of all three. Does the offense violate some quote unquote community standards and does the offense lack uh, serious literary, artistic, scientific expression, right? It's those, it's in, you know, and then there's the sexual component, well, which. That's, that, that's, that's right where I'm like, like the, uh, the merit. It's, that's where I'm like, mm, well, what does that mean? Sure. Yeah. So, like, I also work in, like, philosophy of humor, so there's, like, this huge debate about, like, whether, um, you know, humor has to have a point, right, or whether it is in itself an end and a good. Uh, you know, if you're going, if you're being offensive but humorous, that can still have a function, right? There can, you know, that's where this definition of whether something has merit is uh, really up to debate, and that's why the freedom of speech in this country has changed pretty radically over time. Flag burning wasn't permissible until 1989, I think. Yeah, 1989. Um, so, you know, people did it, they just got put in jail for it. Um, so, you know, as, as our modes of engagement change, you know, humans have a wide array of emotions. So something can be valuable even if it's not serious. So you, you said that uh, freedom of speech has changed over time. Do you see it, like, like in this timeline, that there are historical moments where we, would you say we leapt ahead or we fell backwards? And where are we now? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so, um, so I think that one of the big things, and I don't want to like hog all the talking time, but like one of the big things that's precipitated change in our freedom of speech is technology, mm -hmm. right? The way that we engage with each other and communicate has changed pretty dramatically in my lifetime. So I was born in 81 and we still had like these things called corded phones back then. And so, you know, like the internet wasn't even yet a thing until like I was in high school and so like internet protections didn't come about you know being able to post whatever you want on the internet didn't happen until the end of the 90s 1997 video games weren't protected until the early 2000s uh, Twitter and Facebook by the way your posts are considered protected free speech you can't be fired for them that didn't happen until 2011 
the like function, not protected speech. <laughs> Just so you know, you can still be fired for liking something your boss doesn't like. Yeah, weird, huh? So like, the, there's this really interesting change that's happened that's largely precipitated by technology um, and just like how our speech acts come about in the world, right? Because like, our platforms for speech have changed, so. And I think it demultiplies it, the effect of it, like the, the internet has just, something that would have had maybe a moderate impact on someone's lives or on some exhibit maybe 30 years ago now will just um you know just explode in less than 24 hours and so that has you know possibly a very negative effect on something because let's say you put on an exhibit um that people find distasteful well people thousands of miles away will hear about it and mobilize about it and so uh, movements can gain uh, movements against a particular art or a particular artist or a particular exhibit can gain a lot more uh, strength much faster than it used to. But at the same time, movement and support can also respond to that. So mm -hmm. um, that also has changed dramatically. The fact that how much mobilization you can have in support or against something. I'd like to see if we have any questions from the audience. Yeah. Yes. So going back to the uh, speech acts you had, uh, so why is... Hello, uh, I'm a freshman here. Is that a little loud? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so my question was, you're saying about the speech acts in t of 2011, how you can post something and you're not going to get fired for it, but why is liking a post possibly a way to get you fired? That's, you know, you'd have to ask Congress about why they do things. I think the last hearings when Zuckerberg came and uh, was uh, questioned by the Senate shows how little understanding they have of these platforms. So I would say this would be, um, you know, Maybe, I don't know, maybe something had to give. They had to find something uh, and protect the rest. Um, it might also be based on who's producing the content. If you're the one producing the content on your own wall, then you're expressing yourself. Whereas if you're liking something else that was produced, then you're, you've, I don't know, maybe uh, more of an indirect relationship and then your actions are not as protected because it's not maybe considered uh, speech as much, maybe even more than that. So um, the most recent court case on this in 2011 was Bland v. Roberts, and um, the ACLU has actually been taking this up. So the basic distinction that the court drew between the like function and commenting on Facebook or Twitter is that the comment is a purposive speech act you have to actually like use your brain parts and type something. And so we can see that it's a way to engage in expressive content. So this expressive content clause is usually the thing that does the work. So uh, it was argued that the like function had no expressive content. Now, whether that's right is up for debate, and that's why the ACLU's been taking up the case, and there's been additional um, lawsuits about it. Are they going to be exploring all of the emojis? <laughs> <laughs> we need more emojis, right? We need, we need the, like, puke face one. <laughs> um, and we need the rainbow emoji back. I, also, I want a rainbow emoji. I also have uh, one more question. Uh, okay. So, uh, so given today's political climate and tensions are pretty high, what uh, freedom of speech wise, how do you think it differs from say like five or six years ago to now? Um, so I would say, um, well, it, I mean, I'm trying to understand the context of your question in terms of what has changed. Are you talking about like the Me Too movement? 
and things yeah, like all, all the new movements are coming about. Right, so I think what has changed is that, um, so when you have the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, things like that, I think it, it has changed freedom of speech in terms that it has reinforced, in some ways it has reinforced the ability for certain people who had the right, um, who had freedom of speech before but maybe weren't able to uh, use that right to the same extent that white males had that right um, before. So I think in some sense it has changed uh, the conversation in terms of it has expanded who gets to participate in the conversation. And it's led to some very uncomfortable uh, situations and that's why we get some backlash where people say, oh, we have such a PC culture now, and that's it's that's a false um, way of presenting these conversation. Um, the fact that a lot of people now have to confront things that have been part of society for decades, forever, right? Racism and sexism have been there forever, but we've never really discussed them, and these two movements have allowed us to discuss them. So, I think. The context has changed. You pair that with a very highly partisan uh, context and that which has just been increasing since the 1980s due to you know, other structural, political, cultural issues. But um, it's very easy to describe this as a, to describe these two movements and the conversations they spark as a partisan issues because both political parties have approach them very differently. But fundamentally, it is about who has the right to speak and how much way we give to that speech when it is, uh, when it is spoken. But what made it come about now? Because you're saying these issues have been around for years, so what made it come about now? <sighs> well, it, you know, focusing events. Like we use that term a lot in political science class. Focusing events new technology, uh, you know, the first focusing event in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, I would say you would start with the, the shooting of Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin in 2012. I think uh, young black men had been shot before by law enforcement, by pretend law enforcement like George Zimmerman was, but it wasn't really a subject of national conversation. This one you know, the parents uh, contacted, uh, were contacted, I don't know exactly how it happened, but this one became a topic of conversation. And uh, so then when the next shooting happened, uh, you know, uh, not the next one, but the next one that became part of a conversation was two years later, Mike Brown, that sparked the conversation again and again. And so um, you have this confluence of all of a sudden we have a national conversation about this and we have the means to have a national conversation about this because we have uh, social media platforms, which we didn't have in the 1990s, right? So all of a sudden, people in Florida can talk about this very easily with people in California, Oregon, or across the world even. And so that helps a lot with people who might feel isolated, right? So an African-American community in Florida might feel isolated and not know that the same issues are going on across the country, but through those social media platforms, you do have uh, better mobilization on these issues. And that's, I would say that's what's partly what's changed the conversation as well. Uh, could, could I add to that? The, the, um, the new technology issue is really important um, because we can uh, document the uh, situation happening and then it can be then shared on these platforms, but it's the documentation that ha that's been a game changer. Uh, before, you couldn't prove it, you couldn't, it was your word against the police, and of course, the police are gonna stand by each other. However, a, a video of some, uh, a policeman shooting someone else as they're running away from them in the back, that's hard to dispute. Uh, and that has been part of the, the MO now. It's like, we, we have a conversation now because you can't deny this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 how many in here have had some run-in with the police in, in, a, in a brutal way? Okay, just raise your hand. No one, wow. 
in my time, just about all of my friends. Yes, I, I, I saw a policeman accost a, a young woman. She was scared. She wanted to jump in my car. I knew her. And he's like, no, get, get, leave here. And she was scratched up. And I'm like, a policeman, you know, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't record it. So it's how we then become more uh, able to defend ourselves because of this technology. And at the same time, we pay a price, too. I want to ask a slightly different question. How many of you have seen on your social media platforms videos that other people have posted of problematic engagements with not just police, but maybe people on the street or somebody getting in someone's face? OK. <laughs> so I think that that illustrates how technology mediates and can amplify our awareness of different social events. Um, so something that Professor Lauby mentioned was um, how we weigh evidence and whose voice we listen to. In philosophy, this gets into a vein of the literature called um, epistemic injustice or testimonial injustice. And historically, people of color and women's testimony have not counted as much as white straight men's testimony. And so we're really seeing this play out um, during the Kavanaugh hearings that are happening right now. Right now. Um, so, you know, part of what's going on is how we treat uh, the voice of those that accuse men in power or people in positions of power, um, how we treat the accusers. Right? Do, we, do we shame them? Do we automatically dismiss their claims? Do we try to bury it? Or do we amplify that voice and give them at least equal consideration? That's not to say that we should decide things without due process, but how do we treat that voice? And social media has radically changed um, how we can treat someone's voice. Thank you. And they're making, they're, they're protesting for it, they're going for it, they're saying, she's right, he's wrong, that's the way it goes, and anybody who doesn't agree is wrong too. Can you repeat your yeah. statement so, so can everyone we, else can Then everyone can hear it. Thank you, Arthur. What I said was that there are making decisions without due process about what is right and wrong. And that on my social media feed, I see it. I see people saying, this person's right, that person's wrong. If you don't agree with me, I'm going to ruin your life. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> I have a friend who actually decided on his own to close down or try and close down a particular hardware store that he, uh, that he, that he, uh, went to because they um, supported some anti-gay thing and he was a gay man and he tried to get everybody on his feed to shut this store down people all over the country to write in and tell and, and get the person to change his mind to get his uh, vendors to stop selling to him to do all these things so this is without any kind of due process, just because he decided he didn't like something that was going on at this particular store. And I see it happening over and over again. Right. So um, I want to disentangle a, t a couple of things that went into the comment in question, because these are really good questions. Um, one has to do with uh, deciding things that should be decided by courts outside of courts, which the Kavanaugh conversation has definitely spurred that in a very partisan way. Um, and another part of the question at the latter end when you're talking about the hardware store example, that's somebody that took a specific action that was documented. I'm assuming that the hardware store actually did something that was homophobic or contributed money to conversion therapy or so. I don't know what they did. I don't know the hardware store. Okay, so, so there's... There's actually, I think there's a huge difference between a situation where you have competing views or testimonies versus a situation where somebody is making a claim. 
because um, if somebody makes a claim, especially if we can say that those are what the courts call fighting words, then, you know, we can ask whether you are free from the consequences of that. If I'm a queer person and you put up a sign that says you're not going to serve queer people, well, guess what? Maybe I should express my dis distaste for those business practices because as a business, right, or as a person that makes that claim, you're not free from other people responding, right? So I think other people uh, probably have. I, I, I have two, yes. Yeah. I, I agree. The, uh, maybe it was a heavy-handed approach. I always go back to the whole thing about being more uh, covert. Uh, perhaps a, a photograph of that storefront and the location and let the audience uh, decide for themselves rather than him uh, petitioning it. I think that image probably speaks a lot more than him taking, creating sides. When you see it, it just reverberates with uh, 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 Italians need not apply, Irish need not apply, blacks need not, need not apply, uh, Mexicans, whatever. It just seems the same, and, it, and, and I, I think doing it that way probably is much more effective. Yeah, I mean, it's to go back to that 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 one. You know, is it just that someone at the store made an offhand comment about gays, and therefore the person took all these actions, or did they had a sign outside saying "We will not serve"? When it comes to discrimination, you know, we do allow discrimination in some contexts, right? You have an all boys school and all girl school, fine. Uh, the question is, you know, when when is discrimination not acceptable, and it's when it treats people differently based on race, based on uh, sexual orientation, and in that case, I would say that you'd have, and we had such a case, right? The the wedding cake case that went to, I don't know what it was called, but, uh, you know, where th this baker refused to make a cake for a gay couple that's getting married and they sued him in court. And so um, that person did take a risk. You know, you have a business, if you put a sign outside saying, we will not serve gay people, you know, if you did that in 1980, okay, maybe that would have worked out. If you do that in 2018, you know what kind of response you're going to elicit. And, you know, I would say if you face this kind of discrimination, then you're entitled to a response. You are. I, I have to, before, before you ask the question, it, it's really odd that the, the Supreme Court went against the couple. Yeah. And, and what, what uh, I find appalling is that the, this business is public. As soon as you go public and you discriminate, you're entitled to the worst possible that the law can do for you, to you. But if you decide in your home as a little baker that you're not going to serve whoever, that's your, that's your prerogative. That's you pursuing your happiness. But when you go public, that's a whole different story. Please. I would, I'm sorry, this is going to have to be our last question, but please go ahead. No, you he answered it. The Supreme Court went with you the paper. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, I think um, something that uh, Arthur was referencing was proportional response. And I think uh, there's the question about our righteous indignation and what we do with it. And that's what I hear. There are an awful lot of people who are right right now. And what they want to do is, if you're not right, crush you. Just ruin your life and crush you. And I wonder about some things that could be dealt at a local level. Maybe some things, maybe some misunderstandings, maybe some, um, you know, I, listen, I've had fights with people that I wouldn't want all over the internet. I ride the subway. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want those tapes out there. And I've not always been right, all right? I'm an asshole. Um, <laughs> but everybody's been an asshole.
asshole. So should you have your life ruined for being an asshole? I'm hoping no, as a plea. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, I think we're gonna have to conclude our um, discussion um, because I know some of the classes need to leave. But thank you um, to the faculty for bringing your classes and thank you for the students for your questions and your attentive listening. And thank you to our panelists, of course. <laughs>